Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for our 13th regional webinar outlining the Ontario government's supports for impacted businesses due to COVID-19, particularly within the heritage, sport, tourism, and culture industries. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Before we begin with today's formal presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Minister Lisa Thompson for some introductory remarks. Minister, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm so pleased that we've been able to work together with Minister McLeod to offer this opportunity to learn about supports from our, our government. And if ever before, it's uh, important to have dialogue and to identify how we can move together in a forward fashion in the spirit of recovery, it's certainly now. And uh, I wanna thank Minister McLeod for virtually coming back to the region. I really appreciate it. And I know that everyone, um, if you have questions, there's many of us on the line that can help address your questions and point you in the right direction. And thank you for participating today. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Thompson. And we'll throw it next uh, to MPP Randy Pettipis. Uh Well, thank you. And it's great to be here. And I wanna thank Minister McLeod for uh, setting this up and certainly for her efforts uh, in in uh, in her ministry, um, we we've everybody's had issues throughout this province, and our my writing is no difference. Um, hospitality industry, the, the theater industry, uh, you know, it's just been been quite a uh, quite a last year. Um, so I want to thank you for for setting the, these webinars up, and certainly um, it goes uh, a long way to helping us on the road to recovery. So uh, and I and I do look, I really look forward to that uh, when we get there. As, as all Ontarians are doing. And also Minister Thompson, your ministry, ministry has been very good to us. And uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, the moderator and, uh, and I'm looking forward to this webinar. Thank you, MPP Pettipis. And I'll throw, throw it over to Minister McLeod to kick us off. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. I, I see that we've got uh, well over 130 some people on the line here today uh, from uh, from across your region and uh, wanted to welcome you all. I wanted to say thank you to my colleagues, MPP Randy Pettipis. I've been to his riding on numerous occasions and so very happy that uh, he's able to make it. And of course, my cabinet colleague and my sister, El, uh, Lisa, is, uh, is, is on the line today. We're very close friends, all three of us at Queen's Park. And uh, I'm so delighted that she's able to be on this call because a critical component actually comes from her ministry um, and that will be the last demonstration and she's done an incredible job of making sure small business supports have, have gotten out into uh, into the province. And I'm just absolutely delighted and I wanted to be able to personally say thank you to Minister Thompson for her work and also the dedication of her team and her ministry uh, for getting this done. So I'll just walk you through uh, how today uh, will work and how we're, uh, we're, we're trying to provide supports. This is our 13th uh, and final uh, webinar for small business supports that has gone regionally across Ontario. Uh, we've had over 3,000 people join us uh, from right from my city of Ottawa all the way up to Windsor and uh, throughout the north uh, in order to provide our small business sector, our not-for-profits, and our cultural institutions uh, with um, ways that they might be able to um, access support from our government. The first presentation will be from the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industries, um, and Kevin Finnerty and, uh, and Neil Coburn will walk you through uh, the most recent changes that have been made uh, via Cabinet uh, on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health in terms of transitioning out of uh, the province-wide lockdown, uh, and so they'll be able to put, clarify any questions you may have with respect to that. In addition, they'll be walking you through the $25 million Ontario Arts uh, Council increase and uh, where that money will go and I'm proud to say Randy that uh, the Stratford Festival will be able to access that and of course Minister Thompson so too will the Blythe Festival and we're excited that that's happening and uh, we'll reserve a million dollars of that new funding uh, for our individual artists as well. Uh, secondly we are op opening up a new fund a uh, hundred million 105 million dollar fund at the Ontario Trillium Foundation in addition to its 103 million dollar operating budget. 
in order to build communities back better and stronger. And so we'll be talking about the, uh, the, the community building fund as well. Uh, those programs will both be open imminently and uh, we are going to be able to properly launch them in the next week. Uh, so I'm excited about both of those. From there, we'll go on to a, a Ministry of Finance briefing to talk to you about the small business grant of up to uh, $20,000. The uh, PPE grant from Main Street uh, on the program of $1,000. And then of course the energy and uh, uh, property tax uh, relief that we are offering. And then from there, uh, we'll do a demonstration from Minister Thompson's uh, ministry of the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services to actually walk you through the portal um, to take any questions you may have on how to access that. At any time during this presentation, you're more than welcome to uh, email my ministry for, for, for um, any questions that you have at minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. Alternatively, you can see at the below, there's a Q&A box where you're able to uh, ask questions. Um, some of them we may need to refer to other ministries such as Minister Thompson's. So we will be working on getting those answered as quickly as possible. Some we might be able to answer instantaneously, others we may have to take a bit more time. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Derek Rowland, my Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, who will uh, introduce our next speakers. Um, and thank you very much, all of you, uh, for joining us here today. Derek? Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you, Minister Thompson and MPP Petapisa for your remarks as well. Um, we'll next uh, go over to uh, uh, two representatives uh, from uh, our ministry within the heritage, sport, tourism, and culture industries. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Finnerty, who's our Assistant Deputy Minister for Tourism, uh, Heritage, and Culture, before we uh, bring in uh, Neil Coburn uh, with our Sports uh, Division to walk us through the current uh, uh, reopening framework that will be coming into effect uh, um, later this week, uh, as well as uh, early next week. So, Kevin, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Derek, and thank you, uh, everyone, for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedules to attend today's webinar. So I'll go to the next slide, please. What Neil and I are going to do is walk you through the changes that were announced earlier this week and how they will impact the heritage, tourism, culture, and sports sectors. So I think a key thing is that uh, essentially uh, the government announced earlier this week three things. Uh, to enable the return to the COVID-19 response framework, keeping Ontario safe and open, Three health units have moved out of the province-wide shutdown as of today and have gone into the green zone as of today. So that's Hastings and Prince Edward counties, Kingston, Frontenac and Lennington uh, uh, health unit, and the Renfrew County and District health unit. Um, currently, the rest of the province is still under shutdown. However, on February the 16th, all other public health unit regions with the exception of Peel, Toronto and York will move out of the shutdown and back into the framework, and they'll move into the color code that's most appropriate to them based on the epidemiology of the disease at that time. And likely there'll be an announcement on which color will apply to which region will be made later on this week by the government. So that'll be effective February the 16th, which is Tuesday after the family day long weekend. And then for Peel, Toronto and York, they will move out of the shutdown and back into the framework on February 22nd. So at the end of all this, the COVID-19 response framework, keeping Ontario safe and open, will have been re-implemented across the entirety of the province. So a key thing for everyone on this call to remember is that essentially what this means as the province is going back to the framework as it existed on December 25th. So prior to the first set of restrictions in, that came into effect on December 26th, and additional restrictions that came in force in January. So key message, if I have to say it over and over again, will be, going back to the way things were on December 25th. And so we will now walk you through what this means for some of the, uh, the sectors on this call. I'll turn it over to Neil Corbin to walk you through some of the impacts and changes that affect the sports sector. Over, you, uh, over to you, Neil. Thank you, Kevin. So ski hills. Um, ski hills and most other outdoor snow recreational amenities can operate for recreational purposes in all zones, except the gray shutdown zone with conditions. Any person using a downhill ski lift, including a surface lift, must wear a mask or face covering unless the person is entitled to any of the exceptions set out in the regulation, or in the case of a person using a downhill ski lift or chair, all persons using that chair are the uh, members of a single household. Ski and other outdoor snow recreational amenities, including ski resorts, cross-country ski trails facilities, skating trails, tobogganing hills, dog sledding and snowshoe trails must comply with the general capacity limits for businesses or facilities open to the public. Ski equipment rental, 
can be rented, but it must be cleaned and disinfected as frequently as necessary to maintain a sanitary condition. Next slide, please. Lessons for children and adults at outdoor ski, ice, and snow amenities. So children and adults can be offered uh, lessons in the green, yellow, orange, and red control zone with uh, certain conditions. The total number of students must be limited to the number that can maintain a physical distance of at least two meters and cannot exceed 100 people if your region is in the green, yellow, and red zone, 25 people if your region is in the red zone, in the gray zone and shutdown zone, lessons are prohibited. The use of face coverings while lining up on ski lifts. So any person that enters the ski hill is required to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from any other person using the amenity, unless they're using a ski lift that is a surface lift, using a, a ski lift chair, if at least one empty seat is left between any person who are not members of a single household, a parasport athlete and their attendant or guide and uh, members of the same household. Maintaining a two meter physical distance is not always achievable while on a ski lift, which is why face coverings are mandatory in these settings. Next slide, please. Indoor and outdoor recreation may operate in all zones except the gray lockdown shutdown, provided they comply with the certain conditions. In green, yellow, indoor and outdoor recreation can open with two meter distance, 50 per person per room and 100 people outdoors. In the orange, indoor and outdoor recreation can open with 50 patrons total indoors and 100 outdoors. Fitness classes can open with 10 people per class indoors, 25 outdoors with a three meter distance in the yellow zone and orange zone. In the red control, Indoor and outdoor recreation can open with 10 patrons total indoors and 25 outdoors. Training sessions for members of a sports team uh, that do not include games or scrimmages may occur. And fitness gyms can open with, total, uh, with a total of 10 people keeping a three meter, three meter social distance. In gray lockdown and shutdown, indoor and outdoor recreation is closed with exceptions. No indoor or outdoor recreation uh, classes are permitted in any indoor or outdoor sport or recreation facility. There are certain exceptions for high performance sport athletes who are training for the next para or, or Olympic games or uh, a set number of professional leagues that can return to play with a uh, plan that's been approved by the chief medical officer of health. And um, for people with disabilities to engage in physical therapy in certain circumstances. Next slide. And I'll turn okay. it back. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Neil. So, um, so I'll, I'll walk you through some of the impacts on the culture and tourism sectors. So, uh, on cinemas, uh, I'll have more to say about driving cinemas in a few slides, but just a sneak preview: driving cinemas are now allowed to operate in all zones except for shutdown, which is with the state we're now in. So, but when it comes to indoor cinemas, uh, will be permitted to operate in green, yellow, or orange, with some restrictions. Uh, cinemas in the red or gray zones must be closed unless the facility is being used for the purposes of rehearsing or performing a recorded or broadcasted concert, artistic event, theatrical performance, or other performance. You know, there's some conditions linked to that. No spectators. Every performer or person who provides work at that cinema will have to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from every other person except it's necessary for the purposes of the performance of the rehearsal or for health and safety reasons. If there are singers or players of brass or wind instruments, they have to be separated from any other performers by plexiglass or some other form of impermeable barrier. So in the, in the shutdown zone, which is where we now are, which will, as I said, expire later on this month, cinemas are entirely closed. So if I go to the next slide, please. For performing arts facilities. So uh, concert venues and theaters must remain closed in regions that are in red, and gray with certain exceptions. So concert venues can open in red and gray if the facility is being used for the purposes of rehearsing or performing a recorded or broadcast concert, artistic event, theatrical performance, or other performance subject to the same conditions that I just outlined for cinemas. No spectators, social distancing, and once again, the requirement that singers and players of brass or instruments are separated from any other performers by plexiglass 
or some other impermeable barrier. In green, yellow, orange, uh, performing arts facilities are allowed to open with these certain conditions. So go to the next slide, please. So as I said before, uh, drive-in and drive-through events uh, can now happen. So other than the shutdown zone where we currently are, as I said, shutdown will expire later on this month, drive-in and drive-through entertainment venues across the province can open for events, whether it's movies or theaters or concerts, theatrical productions, performances, artistic events, provided they meet the conditions outlined in the regulations. So while they vary slightly, I would say across the province, they have to adhere to the following conditions. Customers must stay inside the vehicle, except when necessary to purchase admission, food or beverages, use a washroom, or for health and safety reasons. Vehicles have to be separated by a minimum of two meters, and customers have to be in a vehicle designed to be close to the elements. People who work there, like staff and crew, must observe physical distancing at all times, subject to some limited ex exemptions, and face coverings are required in all indoor settings with some exceptions, including while people are consuming food or drink, or if it's required for the purposes of health and safety. And so, as I said, the food and beverage conditions are slightly different across each of the zones, but this gives you a general sense of what's going to be happening across the province once the reopening Ontario framework is fully re-enabled. Go to the next slide, please. So short-term rentals uh, in the current shutdown zone where we are now, short-term rentals are only provided to individuals who need housing. As we go back into the framework, so in gray lockdown, short-term rentals, including cabins, cottages, are only permitted for those who are in need of housing if the rental was reserved after November 22nd, 2020. So cabins and cottages in the gray and shutdown zones must close indoor pools, communal steam rooms, saunas, whirlpools, fitness centers, or other indoor recreational facilities that are part of the operation of these businesses. In green, yellow, orange, and red, all short-term rentals, including cabins, cottages, homes, hunting and fishing camps, resorts, houseboats, condominiums, and B&Bs are permitted to operate. Ice fishing hunts uh, may only be rented if the hut's being used by members of the same household, and if it is not used overnight. Uh, the requirements for ice fishing do not apply if the, if the person is renting the ice fishing hut for the purposes of exercising an Aboriginal or treaty right as recognized by the Constitution. Uh, next slide, please. So for accommodation, hotels, motels, lodges, and other shared rental accommodation, including student residences, uh, will continue to uh, be open as they have been throughout this. So obviously in the red and gray zones, things like communal steam rooms and saunas on the, the premises must be closed. And of course, in the gray zone, indoor pools, whirlpools, indoor fitness centers, and other indoor recreational facilities must be closed. Uh, next slide, please. So restaurants, uh, bars, other food or drink establishments are permitted to operate in all zones subject to conditions and rules outlined in the regulations for those zones. So indoor dining is permitted subject to conditions in green, yellow, orange, and red, including in some cases capacity limits for indoor dinings. In uh, gray and shutdown, uh, restaurants can only offer takeout, drive through and delivery. Uh, nightclubs and strip clubs are only permitted to open if they operate as a food or drink establishment uh, subject to conditions that apply to restaurants, bars and other food uh, drink establishments in the red and gray zones. Next slide, please. So for museums, galleries, aquariums, zoos, science centers, landmarks, historic sites, botanical gardens, a very long list of attractions, they're permitted to open in green, yellow, orange, and red with conditions. Uh, whether the attraction's in the green, yellow, or orange zone, the person who's running the business must ensure that the attraction enables members of the public to maintain a physical distance of at least two meters from other persons. If washrooms are being made available to the public, they have to be cleaned and disinfected as frequently as is necessary to maintain a sanitary environment. Interactive and high contact exhibits can only be open in the green, yellow, and orange zones. And with, obviously with frequent cleaning and disinfection as required. Um, some parts of museums, galleries, aquariums, zoos, science centers, historic sites, landmarks, et cetera, may be impacted 
uh, by changes to other sections of the regulation, especially if they offer dining facilities. So those restrictions have to be considered as operators uh, consider reopening their businesses. In the gray zone, museums, galleries, aquariums, zoos, science centers, landmarks, historic sites, botanical gardens must be closed to the public. Uh, these institutions may open to provide drive-in or drive-through access to the public only if they meet the requirements that I outlined earlier for drive-in and drive-through events. In the shutdown zone where we now are until later on this month, all of these attractions must be closed. So next slide, please. So uh, for public libraries in green, yellow, and or, uh, green, yellow, orange, and red, excuse me, they can remain open subject to conditions. And, uh, and in these zones, patrons can access circulating material that are shelved or in other publicly accessible areas of the library. In the gray zone, um, uh, especially in the lockdown zone, uh, libraries can only open under the following conditions. Circulating materials must be reserved over their phone. Circulating materials may be exchanged with members of the public through contactless drop off, pickup and delivery. In the uh, lockdown zone, uh, patrons must only be permitted to enter the premises to facilitate uh, drop off and pickup or to provide limited access to computers, photocopiers or other similar services. Uh, in gray, patrons cannot go into the book stacks. They cannot handle circulating materials that are shelved or in other areas of library storage. And key point, any circulating materials returned to the library must be disinfected or quarantined for an appropriate period of time before they are recirculated. So libraries can continue and have been doing this to offer mental health, addiction, social and childcare services provided that they record the names of people who attend the library for those purposes and only disclose that information to public health officials as required under law. Next slide, please. Uh, for film and television, so commercial film and television production activity and all supporting activities like hair, makeup and wardrobe are permitted across the province and in all zones, provided that the activities are conducted in accordance with applicable regulatory and public health requirements and restrictions. So key points, no studio audiences. The set must be configured in a way to enable people on the set to maintain physical distancing of at least two meters from other people unless it's necessary for the actual filming of the, uh, the filming of the TV or film production. Uh, persons who provide hair and makeup services must wear appropriate PPE. If there are singers and, or players of brass or wind instruments, they must be separated from other performers by plexiglass or some other form of impermeable barrier like the condition in place for performing arts centers. Key point, Film and television productions can take place at locations that are otherwise required to be closed to the public. So for instance, if restaurants are closed in parts of Ontario, they can be used as film and television production sets for the purposes of filming a dining scene. So that is allowed under the regulation. Uh, and obviously in the uh, gray lockdown zone, a COVID-19 safety plan is required for film and television productions. So next slide, please. So those are the requirements of the new framework, which will come into place, as I said, starting February the 10th, today, February 16th, and February 22nd. There's a lot of detail here, but mo the information I've just outlined for you, along with my colleague Neil, is available on the Ontario.ca COVID website, and we'll provide the URL for you after we're done. So as the Minister said, I uh, want to provide a few details on two funds that were announced in Budget 2020. So the province is investing $100 million over two years to develop a community building fund that will support community tourism, cultural and sport organizations who are experiencing significant financial pressures due to the, due, due to the pandemic. Um, funding support will be available to not-for-profit organizations and municipalities, and the program will be delivered by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, and the program will have two streams. The first stream will provide supports for local community tourism, heritage and culture not-for-profits like community museums, local theaters, fairs, cultural institutions, to help them sustain their operations in the short term, but to also create new attractions, experiences, and events for the longer term. And the second stream will be funding for municipalities and not-for-profit sport and recreation organizations to make capital investments 
in infrastructure rehabilitation and renovation so that they can meet public health protocols as well as the needs of their local communities. So the Ontario Trillium Foundation will be delivering this program, very well positioned to deliver funding to municipalities, Indigenous communities, and the entire not-for-profit sector. They have extraordinarily strong relationships with sector stakeholders, and they have years of experience in delivering grants on behalf of the government in a timely manner. They have great systems in place for processing and evaluating applications, as well as for tracking and reporting on results. As the minister said, uh, this will be announced, uh, launched in the very near future. So more information will be available once it's formally launched. Next slide, please. And finally, um, as the minister said, the budget announced additional funding of $25 million for Ontario's arts institutions to help them cover operating losses incurred as a result of COVID-19. This funding will help these organizations like the Stratford Festival, like the Blythe Festival to remain solvent and prepare for a time when they can fully reopen their facilities, resume full programming and welcome back their audiences and visitors. So the Arts Council has been selected to deliver this program. They have 50 plus years of uh, expertise uh, dealing with the arts sector, including the major organizations like the Stratford Festival. They have great systems in place for processing and evaluating these funding applications for tracking and reporting on results. As the minister said, we're just finalizing the uh, program design for this initiative and more information will be uh, available in the coming days. So uh, that's it for, uh, for Neil and I, so thank you. Um, and as I said at the beginning, there's more information that are available on the COVID-19 uh, website for the province and all of these initiatives and uh, you can find more information there. So I'll turn it back over to Derek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I appreciate uh, you walking uh, through some of the finer details uh, of uh, the reopening framework, as well as those two uh, uh, funding opportunities that will be uh, announced uh, and open in the very near future, the Ontario uh, Trillium Foundation's Community Building Fund, as well as the Core Arts uh, Institution Supports. Uh, I um, want to remind everyone that there is a QA box uh, below. If you do have a question, you're welcome to put it uh, in there and we'll try our best to answer it. However, we may ask you to contact us separately by emailing minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. Um, today's presentation is uh, brought to you uh, by our Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries, uh, but uh, featuring uh, some uh, special additions from the Ministry of Finance, uh, Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, as well as uh, the Ministry of uh, Government and Consumer Services. So if we can't answer your question, uh, we'll certainly make sure that uh, we find an answer for you or at least uh, put you in touch uh, with an individual who will be able to assist. With that, I'm going to turn it next uh, over to Tim Sherman. He is an Assistant Deputy Minister in uh, the Ministry of Finance to walk us through the Small Business Support Grants, which will, uh, pro which could provide uh, up to $20,000 uh, for eligible uh, businesses uh, impacted uh, by the lockdown measures and additional restrictions brought in uh, by the government as a result of COVID-19. So with that, Tim, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for that. So it's gonna provide a kind of a high level overview of, of the grant and um, hopefully be a helpful scene setter before folks take you through the detail of the, of the portal. So turning to slide two, government announced uh, the move to a, to a broader province-wide shutdown on December the 21st and at the same time announced that it would be introducing a new Ontario small business support grant in recognition of the impact that the shutdown would have on Ontario small businesses. It's worth noting that this new grant is over and above uh, other existing programs that the province has put in place, such as the property tax and energy rebates, um, or the support that's available to businesses through many uh, federal programs. So the new grant will provide a minimum of 10,000 and up to 20,000 for eligible small businesses that are expected to experience a minimum of a 20% decline in revenue. So every small business will be able to use the support to navigate the challenging times and whatever makes the most sense for them. Um, I think all of you on this call will have a much better sense of some of the, the ways in which businesses will be able to use this support. Um, and there are three basic eligibility requirements in the bottom of the slide, which are probably a helpful framework to use when thinking about um, eligibility for the program. Well, first, the business needs to be either closed or significantly restricted by the provincial shutdown. And we have a list of businesses that, or categories of businesses that meet that eligibility later on in the slide deck. And the portal, of course, and the application will make that clear. Second, this is targeted at small businesses. 
Um, and so the definition uh, that is being used for this program is common in, in other contexts. And it's having less than 100 employees. So basically between zero and 99 employees at the enterprise level. And finally, the business needs to be able to demonstrate that it will experience a minimum of 20% revenue decline as a result of the shutdown. The primary way that this will be measured is by comparing April 2020 with April 2019 monthly revenue. Uh, but there are alternate measurements in place for businesses who were maybe established outside this window. And we also have a slide to show you what some of those uh, comparator points will be. And of course, applications for the new program opened today. So the, the portal that folks will take you through is now available for applications. Next slide, please. So there's just a couple of examples uh, on this slide, which we thought might be helpful to take folks through so you can kind of understand how those parameters that I just walked through sort of tangibly uh, work their way through the program. So we have kind of two companies, company A, company B on the bottom of the slide there. And I think we just assume that both these companies meet the business eligibility uh, test in terms of being shut down or significantly restricted. And if you look at company A on the left, so you'll see that it says there it'll experience a monthly loss of $20,000, which is equivalent in their context to a 25% decline in revenue. So that means they meet the 20% revenue test and they will be eligible for a $20,000 um, uh, grant, which is also the maximum, but it fully offsets the uh, the revenue decline that's been uh, presented by the, by the company. And then on the, on the right, uh, there's a monthly loss of 15,000, which is also 20%. So they meet the 20% threshold uh, for the decline, and that entire amount, 15,000, would be uh, would be funded. So turning the slide forward to talk a little bit about the revenue comparators. So as I mentioned before, businesses that perhaps were not in operation in April 2019 will still be able to calculate a revenue decline using various alternative revenue decline comparators. And the goal here is to uh, make sure that uh, all sm small businesses um, will be able to be eligible to apply uh, for the grant. Um, as you see, the chart on this slide shows the different comparators. So I think um, one thing you'll notice when you look at the comparators is what the program is trying to capture is two points in time. One where the business would have been kind of in normal operations versus when they would have been experiencing some kind of public health restriction. So for example, if you look at the second row in the chart, um, this is for a small business that went into operation after uh, April 2019 and so as a result couldn't use that more general comparator. So sometime between May 2019 and January 2020, the revenue comparator that they would use is February 2020 and um, April 2020. When you think back, February was sort of a pre-pandemic, pre-lockdown, provincial lockdown uh, month whereas April, uh, the province was in a lockdown scenario. And so as a result, it's meant to be a good representation of the impact that that business would have been experienced uh, in the current provincial shutdown. And then just a note at the bottom of the slide, uh, winter seasonal businesses will uh, also be permitted to apply. And there's an alternative revenue decline comparator of they can choose between December 2019 and December 2020 or January 2020. December 2020, and that's just a recognition that winter seasonal businesses may have a different um, rhythm and cadence to their business. And so we're providing some flexibility for those businesses. All right, and then slide five um, provides the list of eligible small business types. So these are ones that are subject to closures or significant restrictions under the current shutdown. Uh, as we mentioned, this is sort of the first test that businesses need to meet as part of the application process. Um, and if they meet this plus the revenue test, they will be able to receive a minimum of 10,000 and up to, up to 20,000. Um, for the period of the provincial shutdown, I uh, just wanted to note that this is also the list of businesses that will be eligible for the, <coughs> excuse me, for the property tax and energy rebate. So I know we're, we're focusing on this program, but it's just another reminder that there are other support programs in place uh, for businesses. So if they don't meet some of the other tests, for example, around revenue for employees. There are these other uh, rebates that we can also apply for, and it's all in the same portal, which makes it much easier for businesses to be able to enter that information. And then the, the footnote on the bottom there, just to be clear that there are businesses that are not eligible 
and those include those that were already required to close prior to the introduction of the modified stage two measures in October. So that's kind of the starting point for determining business eligibility. And then of course, any essential businesses that are permitted to operate either within capacity restrictions or otherwise being essential are not eligible. For the program. And so this is the final slide and hopefully that gives you a good snapshot of program parameters and eligibility. And I will turn it over to, um, I guess it's folks to take you through the, the portal itself. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. I appreciate you walking us through some of the finer details of that small business support grant uh, program. Uh, for those of you who may have uh, joined us uh, previously before the holidays, uh, we actually talked about this uh, uh, before Christmas, uh, and now the program is uh, finalized, approved, and uh, open to intake. Uh, that's some of the finer details there. We certainly encourage you to take advantage of uh, them uh, uh, so long as your organization is uh, eligible. Um, moving uh, right along, I'm going to next uh, turn it over to Manisha Agarwal, who's with the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, to walk us uh, through the TPON uh, database uh, to uh, explain exactly how to submit that application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With the Small Business Support Grant, the PPD Grant, the Street, as well as the Energy and Property Grant. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everyone uh, that following today's presentation, uh, we will be sending a link to as well as link to uh, directly uh, link you to the uh, database uh, to submit your application, as well as additional uh, background material on the programs uh, that are upcoming, so that if you are not taking uh, any notes uh, or if you need to, to reference back anything uh, that is discussed today, it will be sent directly uh, to you and made available. So with that, Manish, I will turn it over to you to begin your presentation. So I've heard about this new program and I come to Ontario.ca uh, with this background. Here, I click on English, and I see the link where it says support we are providing for small business. I want to know as a small business, uh, what kind of support I'm getting from the government of Ontario. I click on this link, which, which takes me to a page with all details about the different programs uh, that the government of Ontario is having for uh, in support of small businesses. Uh, I see here that there's a new program. I click on it, and it takes me to, to the page where uh, it provides me the list of the programs that are currently available onto a small business support grant, uh, onto your Main Street relief grant, VP support, property tax, energy cost rebates, and what you need to apply. Uh, so the program information, uh, what the program is, uh, what I will get as, get as a small business, uh, what are the eligibility criteria, and uh, information about the other programs as well. So I decide to apply uh, for the Ontario Small Business Support Grant because I meet the eligibility criteria. I, I'll click on Apply for Funding. Now when I click for Apply for Funding, I'm going to take you to show you the test page because I don't want to overwhelm uh, the live system. So it brings me uh, to a page like this. So uh, what you have here is uh, here is that uh, get help button, uh, which allows me to get help from the contact center or get access to the program information guide. Uh, if I want to apply in French, I can switch to French as well. If I've already applied uh, for the other programs, I don't need to start a new application. I can resume the application or if I have saved the application for draft because I didn't have all the information, I can continue uh, with the same application. Or I can apply for funding. I can start with a new uh, application. So uh, given that I'm a new applicant, I'm going to click on apply for funding. And it brings me to this page where uh, I need uh, I need to check the eligibility if I can apply for these programs or not. I, by default, the new program is selected. I can select multiple programs if I'm interested, or I can just apply for that program. I click on check eligibility, which will again take me to a series of questions uh, to check my eligibility for the program. Uh, the first question for the small business support grant program is: Was my business required to close? temporarily or significantly uh, restrict services as a result of being subject to province-wide shutdown? I would say yes. Does your business have less than 100 employees? That's the definition for a small business. Would you say yes? And is my business expecting at least 
a 20% revenue decline. Um, I have a handy reference to the business guide that I can access uh, if I want to know more information about what revenue decline means. I'll say yes, and then I click on next. Now, it says that I'm eligible for the following funding program uh, down to a small business grant. I'm going to start my application. Now, when I start my application, uh, it takes me to a, a series of steps. It's going to ask me to uh, provide my business information, my contact information, information related to the new Ontario Small Business Support Grant, then review all the information I provided in the three steps, provide my banking information, and submit. So I come here, I provide my legal name, so I'm running a small business, Olivia T room, so I provide the information. Uh, I run it as store of happiness. And I provide my CRA business number. Now at this stage, I can validate the business number if I'm not sure if my business number is correct or not. If, if it's correct, I don't need to validate it there. Uh, if I don't know where to get the business number, I will provide a handy tip. Uh, it can be found on the GST, GST return or the employer payroll or T2 corporate tax filing. Now, if I'm a self proprietor who doesn't have a business number, we also provide a handy link on how to obtain the business number from the CRA website. The next step is to provide the address information. I can use address local fire postal code, or uh, if I know the address, I can directly key it in. Okay, so I have that. My mailing address is same as head office address. If it's different, uh, I can provide that as well. Click on next. Uh, here I'm going to provide my contact information. Nash, last name is phone number and my email address. Okay, so I provide the information, I've confirmed my email address is that. Uh, it's very important to provide the correct email address, uh, validate it again, because that's the address that is being used uh, in terms of sending emails, confirming the receipt of your application, uh, confirming the payment process, and if you have to come back and resume your application. I'm going to confirm that I'm the owner and I have the signing authority uh, for the individual trust for the business. At this point, I can save a draft, which allows me to come back. If I don't have all the information, I can come back and uh, resume the application. All this information will be saved. I don't have to provide that information again. Click on Next. Now here, I'm going to provide information very specific to the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. Uh, right up front, we provide the application guide, uh, which the users can uh, review, the applicants can review, uh, in case they have more questions or they want to find more about the program. Uh, I need to provide my business type and if it's restaurants and bars. Now it asks me if my question is part of an enterprise or an affiliated enterprise. Uh, we have a handy tip in terms of what it means, uh, enterprise, or they can refer to the application guide for more information. So my business is not part of an enterprise, so I'm not going to check that. Now here, uh, if I, if I was having a winter seasonal business, uh, uh, like a, you know, a, a ski uh, a resort or uh, uh, any, any business that is uh, uh, associated with winter uh, seasonal, I can say yes. And it will ask me a series of questions. Uh, if my business was in operation in the current business, business structure in December 2019, if I say yes, uh, it's going to ask me for my highest monthly revenue, either in December 2019 or January 2020, given that many 
winter seasonal businesses don't start operating until January. For the purposes of this demo, I'll say no, my business, my business is not, not a winter seasonal business. Then the next question is, was my business in operation in the current business structure in April 2019? If I say yes, it will ask me to provide number of employees, my revenue in April 2019, my revenue in April 2020. If I say no, uh, it asks me, it, it prompts me to provide my business full, first full month of operation, uh, you know, uh, the month. And based on that, it's going to ask me for the same information in terms of number of employees, what was my revenue, and in, in February 2020, what was my revenue in April 2020. Uh, for the purpose of the demo, again, I'll say yes, it was in business structure in operation in April 2019. Uh, the number of employees were 10. Uh, the revenue was 10,000 in April 2019. In April 2020, the revenue is 2,000. Can I attest that the information I'm providing is all good? I go through the terms and conditions. They agree. I have provided now information with respect to this program. I'll say next. Now here I can review all the information I've provided, the business information, the contact information, <coughs> sorry, uh, the information related to Ontario Small Business Support Grant. So all the information has, has been provided, it all looks good. I can go to the next step, which is to provide my banking information. There's a sample check, copy of sample check provided, just in case people want to see where their branch, what their branch number, institution number, and account number is located on the check. So I'll put that in here. And I'll select the institution number. Now there are many, many banks. We're just not limiting to the top five. Uh, yeah, they, are, they are, we cover, uh, a broad spectrum of banks uh, within the province. And provides account number. That's it. Then verify that all the information I provided is correct. And click on submit. So when I click on submit, again, some terms and conditions, I'll be attesting as many Shagrawal that all the information I'm providing is true agree and submit. So uh, once I do that, my application is submitted. And uh, uh, so it, it, it's just a test environment. So it's saying that there's a problem because I've already used the CRA business number. So we have a check as well to ensure that the CRA business number is not used again. Uh, there, there's only one application that can be submitted with that application. But once I click on submit, uh, I'll, uh, my application will be submitted and I'll, I'll get a, a, a notification uh, saying uh, that your submission, uh, your, your application has been submitted. Let me quickly share the email with you uh, on how it looks. Uh, the business will receive, a, receive an email similar to this where it says that you've applied for this program, there's your authorization number, and uh, it's under review. And if it's approved, you will receive a subsequent confirmation email notifying that, that your payment has been processed. And that it takes around two weeks uh, to receive your payment once the application has been approved. Great, thank you very much, Manish, for walking through uh, some of the finer details uh, of exactly how to submit uh, an application. Appreciate you making uh, time for us here today. Uh, before we uh, depart, I'm gonna turn it back to Minister McLeod for any closing remarks. Minister, over yeah, to you. I Thanks very much, Derek. I think because the most recent, uh, the, the, the presentation that we had was from Minister Thompson's um, ministry, perhaps Minister Thompson, you'd like to uh, offer some uh, concluding remarks. We got you on mute though. Darn it. There we go. Thanks very much, Minister McLeod. And uh, I just want to 
congratulate you and your team for facilitating that this type of info webinar because uh, I think it's important that we get out to grassroots and rural Ontario matters. So we really appreciate the time and effort that you've invested to make sure that businesses in this region have a chance to uh, see what's available to them. And uh, again, through your ministry, all of the supports that you're offering, and then again, uh, taking a look at how we're supporting business through the pandemic, it has been um, valuable today and through the other 12 webinars that you've hosted. In terms of the grants, we wanna encourage everyone to make sure that you take time to apply. If you have invested money in PPE, there's that $1,000 grant that's available to you. Make sure you take a, a look at that program and apply if you feel it's warranted for your business. The energy and tax rebates, again, this is a phenomenal opportunity for small businesses to realize how their provincial government here in Ontario is wanting to support you. Take the time, take a look at the programs, and please apply, and the, the dollars are there to support you. In terms of the small business support grants, uh, we have been overwhelmed, and uh, it's uh, it just shows to the point that uh, we need to do everything we can to minimize red tape, re relieve the burden on your shoulders, and support how we can. And the small business grant is something that we all readily supported when, when we realized we were going back into a, a restricted time in December. And uh, please take your time, apply. And if I can share with you, we've paid out almost half a billion dollars already in, in support for small businesses across Ontario. And uh, we are working as best we can through the application process. We partner with the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, as well as with the Ministry of Finance. And then once it hits my ministry, we facilitate the payment. And so I can tell you though, it's very important that you take your time when you apply to get your information right. Otherwise, there's gonna be back and forth and delays in your application process before it ever gets to my ministry to pay you accordingly. So um, again, please take time to become familiar with the supports that we're making available to you. And again, Minister McLeod, thank you so much for coming back to this region of Ontario and sharing your enthusiasm for your sectors and allowing us to join you today. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Minister Thompson, uh, for your, uh, your, your work that you've done in this ministry. And I know uh, you've got a lot on your plate. So thank you for taking the time with us. And, and thank you uh, for welcoming me back. I can't wait to be back there in person with you. We had such a lovely time this past summer uh, doing all things heritage, sport, tourism and culture um, in uh, Huron-Bruce. And it, I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to getting up there again and, and flowing more supports to your, your institutions there. So ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for joining us. I think we had over 150 people at, at, uh, on the call. And so make sure to uh, heed the, the um, advice of Minister Thompson to take care of uh, all of the fine details so we can get that money out to you very quickly. And we'll look forward to uh, continued support uh, from this ministry um, into our sector. So thank you all very much and stay safe. And uh, next week, I think we're going to all uh, I'll be in a little bit better of a spot because uh, we'll be going out of uh, out of the province-wide lockdown and out of the stay-at-home order. And I think that's going to be uh, great news for all of us. So, so thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.